I believe that I was reading from my novel on the night he came the night he saw it. to listen to me. He was looking for voices. And, and Gerard said, Gerard Malang, then you have to hear this voice. And I was probably reading the, uh, the most uh, experimental section of the novel, which begins with the sentence, in America everything is great, even that which is not good, and probably gave it a tour de force reading. What he remembers is, uh, aside from my voice, uh, that there were just piles of paper. He couldn't believe how much paper, how much writing there is. I had written a, a screenplay before, but uh, called Tarzan of the Flicks, that is very long and unlike any uh, um, a Warhol movie. And uh, and it was you. I used it to read at, at, at poetry readings, and it was never filmed, though it was staged at, at Goddard College with David Mamet. In it. Oh, and really? it, that was his first stage experience, and that's how he remembers it. They, they were very serious then. This is a major. This is Cecil B. DeMille time for the horror. It was Cecil B. DeMille. What's nice about uh, the restored soundtrack is that you hear Andy directing, and it may have been the only time he did that in his entire uh, film career, actually gave instructions to the actors. He would not have known that it was being picked up. He certainly wasn't interrupting me in screen when I could have used some help. <laughs> How about doing something there instead of making me crazy? You, you know what I mean? <laughs> How unforgivable. <laughs> I like the point where, as I finally figured out, the wig must have, that Mario's wearing must have shocked all of us. Like, what is that on his head? Cat, cat it's finally, yeah, I know. Am I the one who says I finally figured it out? It's a skin cat, and it perfectly matched. White pussy, it was cool. <laughs> it even got star billing. Yes, it got star billing. It was Carol's cat, right? And she shampooed it for the occasion, <laughs> right? Um, the the general interpretation of it now, and it's really open to it, is that Carol Kaczynski is playing Jean Harlow's mother, and that Philip would be. Uh, the, the mother's gigolo, right? That was costing so much money um, uh, f for the mother, that who was driving Jean Harlow, and that Gerard would be uh, representative of, of of Jean Harlow's failed husbands. That's a very literal interpretation and suggests that uh, Andy actually read biographies of Gene Harlow, which I'm not sure he did. No question that the idea of my writing uh, screenplays was Philip's idea. One of the major turning points in my life was Philip's demand on Andy that I that I write uh, screenplays because then my life took this entire turn into uh, you know a film and theater for the, for the next uh, 25 years. It's hard to think of anyone else who had such a crucial effect on my life. You know what I mean? In, in, in turning my life in the in a specific direction. This is the very first experience of, of Andy moving through me to the to the subject matter and using me as his intermediary and finally he was going to replace himself with me, right? When he wouldn't be present at the filming at all. But he desperately wanted uh, Philip to shine uh, and, and be wonderful. So that was tense, made, made me tense. And, 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 and I think he would move from shoulder to shoulder. Uh, I was clearly sitting to the audience's right of Philip, right? And uh, but at at some point, Andy seems to have moved. 
to the left because you see Philip look to him, particularly when he's embarrassed or to see his uh, reaction or when it's a joke um, involving Andy. This is also true of every uh, Warhol film that I was involved with, that uh, you become very aware of what's not on the screen. Um, very, very conscious, and also you become so you become conscious of space and time and and all of that. These things seem obvious now that we know how to look at these movies. You remember too, in those days, these movies would have been quite shocking to people because partially out of the gayness, but the real thing is nothing's going on. And these films were teaching people how to look. I mean, that's really not to how you look at a face, right? So now we know how to do that, and it's. Uh, I'm surprised it hasn't attracted more attention. You know, um, the, the movie it stands up quite for in in the earth of of a, as a successful film. You must remember also that when those films were being made, I didn't take them seriously. It was a way of my killing time while I waited for my novel to be published, hence the, the stuff with Guy Simmons and Burroughs. I knew after Kitchen was made, I don't know if you know that movie, that there was uh, nowhere further for me to go in the direction I wanted to go toward real acting and real films, and but then Andy could not do that. The way you act in a ridiculous play, choose the most obvious thing that you could possibly do at this moment and exaggerate it to as if your life depended on it. Uh, Maria Montez. Dominican-born queen of Technicolor was Universal Studios' biggest moneymaker during World War II. No person ever went so far to represent the difference between a screen appearance and a stage performance. This doesn't mean she couldn't act when she would go on in her, in, in, at the end of her career to work with the tour directors like Max Ophels and uh, uh, Orson Welles and John Brown, who insisted that she act, she would leave those roles untouchable. No actor can approach them. She just didn't think acting was the right thing to do in front of a movie camera. Uh, we're following, in a way, her example that we're not interested in a performance that is an actor interpreting a role but rather presenting themselves, so they'd have to be particularly presentable, that the camera would have to be able to read their soul, and in her case, her very thoughts. They would be the ideal. And I wanted to see in the early theater of the ridiculous, if you could get this on stage where the person themselves is so interesting that, they, that the character they're playing is merely an excuse to get them onto the stage, what they are really presenting to the audience is themselves. This was a standard in, in the early theater of the ridiculous, that we chose actors that you could watch endlessly because they were, one, that fascinating, and two, they projected the fascination that was themselves. The Vice Squad story. Um, <laughs> She would come out of the shower uh, dripping wet, Beverly Grant, every night, nothing but a pair of see-through pink panties. And uh, the vice squad came, and, and, and she had long, long black hair, and I said, look, when you pull aside the uh, curtains of the shower, you're to come out with your uh, long black hair covering your breasts, if you don't mind. She also had spike heels and walk across the stage and uh, pick up the phone and ask for Dick's delicatessen. I, I need a tongue. No, no, don't slice it. <laughs> so I sit down, the vice squad is there. <laughs> 
very comfortable that we're cool, this is okay, this will be... I, she pulls aside the curtain and steps out with her long black hair <laughs> covering her breasts, and then in one graceful gesture, throws back all the hair <laughs> and walks across the stage. Uh, after the show, I said to her, Beverly, <laughs> we could all be in the, the Huska tonight. And she said, Ronald, you don't seem to understand. Uh, I feel I have small breasts, and I've always been very self-conscious about it. And I feel that if I can parade them in front of the public every night, I'll lose the self-conscious problem. <laughs> The heart of the movie is that the actors do not know what I'm going to ask them to say and do. So the question was, well, how do you do it the second night when they already know uh, what is in the script? Um, you would really have to ask someone who has performed in it, like Augusto Machado, who's here, how did you do that every night for a run? Uh, I have this gift is... I have an imperfect memory, and so it was fresh every night. The actors had to come up with a substitution for, for surprise. They made it work for months by becoming almost a frightened family, you know? Frightened of the director and what he might say, so they had to substitute a kind of uh, old-fashioned acting, you could call it, for... Uh, for not being surprised by what they would be told. It was based on Screen Desk 2 because it began with Mario. John would play the director, John Beccaro, and sit on a ladder almost at the back of the theater and shout to him uh, what to do. But after a while, actors <laughs> who were waiting to do in Indira Gandhi, which was the formal play, on, on this double bills. I would get impatient. Because sometimes Mario would become interesting and it was going on this curtain raise longer than possible. And that's when suddenly Charles Ludlam appeared on the stage as Norma Desmond from Sunset Boulevard <laughs> and said, oh, but, 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 don't, 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 don't stop, keep going. John, how are you? Do you remember when we used to do smokers down on 2nd Avenue? Okay, I'll just sit here, I'll just sit, I'll wait, I'll wait. We'll go out to dinner afterwards. And uh, gradually uh, insinuate oh, themselves yeah. <laughs> into, so you had three people and then it became fascinating uh, if you had, I I any configuration you had, two drag queens or a real woman and a drag queen. It particularly fascinated the, uh, the audience. Then they were, we wanted to get uh, Mario off the stage and couldn't figure out how because John wanted to get a Charles Moore space and uh, they turned to me and said you could be the hunchback of Notre Dame and so as Ronald said with two cents worth of makeup I went on stage and tried to abduct Mario <laughs> it just became a lot of ad living also I'm very fresh and uh, it, it just, it, it could go on. It was originally 20 minutes and we'd sometimes reach an hour because it was sizzling. But by the time it, uh, you know, the run closed, the initial one, there was no resemblance to uh, the film at all. Finally, there was a screen test four that I did for the actor's studio. Uh, you were working with uh, Strasburg? Or well, he, I was working for him. I was actually their first playwright in residence. Yeah. yeah. So Strasburg had never seen anything like that and couldn't imagine what it was. <laughs> I still hadn't figured it out. <laughs> no, he would die without ever figuring it out. John would say, well, said, well what? Where's the line? And then, of course, the famous. <laughs> In my day, we didn't need lines. We had faces. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I mean? <laughs>